All right, you can be seated. All right, uh, if you would, please, I'm going to be talking on the pillars again. Turn to Malachi, turn to the book of Malachi. The next pillar in the Christian life I'll be speaking about is, is that of tithing. Tithing. Malachi chapter 3 is where we'll begin. I think some people get uncomfortable with this topic, uh, especially those who, who aren't participating in, uh, in the call of God to tithe and to support the local church in that area, in that way. Um, I uh, maybe spent a little bit of my Christian life where I was kind of uncomfortable with the subject, but, uh, but now I just, I just try to be faithful in it. I find it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy of a grace. It's pretty easy of a ministry uh, once, once you recognize and get on that routine. Um, although in the, in the beginning it might be really shocking. Um, I'm not so uncomfortable speaking about it because it's just another one of God's commands. And so we've got to be faithful and talk about all of God's commands. Uh, though this one does have some personal attachments to certain people just because, uh, um, you know, you'll, you'll know where someone's heart is <laughs> quite often based on where their pocketbook lies. Um, but nonetheless, uh, let's go on to Malachi chapter 3. And in verse 8, we begin where the Bible reads, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. The Bible begins here with that question, and, and the book of Malachi, if you've ever read it, has these same kind of uh, the questions where God is asking the nation certain questions, and they often have that same response, well, well where in? Well, well, well how? What, what, what meanest thou? They're, they're, they're responding to the Lord. Um, almost the assumption is, well, what do you mean we've robbed you, Lord? We, we, we have, of course not, but he says this, he says, in tithes and offerings. That's where they're robbing God. And the punishment is clear. In verse 9 it says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation, the Bible says, as a whole, has robbed him. Now the nation shouldn't be confused about the topic of tithing, and I believe that this dates way back to even Genesis chapter uh, 1. Um, some will say that uh, the tithe is part of, of the Levitical law, and therefore it's not applicable unto us. Now I do have a case in Genesis chapter 2, where I believe maybe not necessarily the tithe, though it is a theory that many hold, um, I believe there is something here that is set apart and specific and, and, and given unto the Lord that's not to be taken of or partaken of by men. So this long history goes all the way back. So I believe Israel had really no right to say, wherein have we robbed you, as if they didn't understand what they were doing. Genesis 2 and verse 15 reads this. It says, And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So here we have a garden. The man was given there to keep it. They were placed in the garden. And uh, it was very specific. The Lord was very specific when he said that of every tree thou mayest eat except that portion. They have provision of all of the trees within the garden except for one specific tree, which was set apart and different. The Lord said, of the, knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, lest ye die. Look over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. Where the Bible says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to be make one to make one wise, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and then and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So the Lord set apart this special tree, and the theory comes in is that this, is that there were, there were perhaps ten trees in the garden, nine could be eaten, and then one was set apart. The tenth, or the tithe of that, was set apart, and it was to not be eaten. And yet the woman here, she sees the tree, that it was good for food, and that it was pleasant to her eyes, and that tree desired to make one wise. In other words, she saw in her carnal mind that this tree could benefit her in some way. Even so, the, the tenth portion of the income is often looked upon with that same mentality, that it, it is one that is good, it is one that is pleasant, it is one that is desired to make one wise, a desire to make one grow, a desire to make one 
benefit, and yet it was set apart. If you look over in uh, verse 22, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, Behold, man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And therefore the Bible says that they were cast out of the garden. So we know the story that Adam and Eve both partook of that tree which was not theirs to give. In fact, that tree was set apart. It was specific and it was only for God. Because in verse 22, the Bible shows that when they took of it, they became as one of us. Or they became as God in such way where they knew good and evil. They had something. They took something that was not theirs. And therefore, they had broken God's law in that area. And that's where the theory comes in is that it was the one of ten trees. Um, and therefore, it was the tithe that was supposed to be set apart for the Lord. So let's talk about some practicals about the tithe. Turn to Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus 27, <clears throat> we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, third book of the Bible. If you go to Leviticus 27, <clears throat> and in verse 30, <clears throat> the Bible reads, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, it is, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, whether he change it, neither shall he change it. Sorry. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So some practicals that we see here. In verse 30 it says that the tithe of the land is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. In other words, it is set apart to the Lord. And as you read down in verse 32 it says this. It says, the tenth shall be holy unto Unto the Lord. So something that we see here is, first of all, it is holy. It is set apart. It is specific to God. It belongs to God. And the next thing that you see in verse 32 is that it's to be indiscriminate. It's to be almost a routine. As you see in verse 32, it says, Concerning the tithes of the herd or of the flock, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Now what I believe is being spoken of there is essentially when you would bring in your herd after they were done grazing, the, uh, the shepherd would stand there with his rod and it says, Whatsoever passeth under it, the tenth thereof shall be holy unto the Lord. So he would have the rod. He would let them begin to go into the fenced off area and he would say, One, two, three, four, ten. Set it apart. One, two, three, four, and up to ten. Set it apart. One, two, three, four, up to ten. Set it apart. In other words, there was a routine of it. It was not to be something that was discriminated. In other words, as it says in verse 33, he shall not search whether it be good or bad. In other words, he's not going to say, okay, this tenth is of the Lord. And then he gets to the next ten, and he goes, ooh, that one's a little rough. I'm going to give him the ninth one instead. Now, the Bible says that if that's the case, then he's to give them both. If he sees one that maybe is, is, is feeble, if one that is uh, uh, bruised or, or, or un, unclean in some way, and he was to say, ooh, that one's not for the Lord, it's not to be in a greedy state. In other words, ooh, that one's, that one's, uh, that one's good. I don't want to give that one. It's, in fact, it, it would be to, to call the tenth to call the tenth, and then you see that the tenth is just ill-favored and not, not great offering, you would give the one beside it, which is the ninth, which is a little bit better, which looks nicer, which is cleaner of an animal, you just give them both. In other words, you are, you're stepping it up. You are giving God even more so because you've recognized that the tenth is just not worthy to give unto the Lord. But too often we'll, we'll, we'll discriminately count and count and count and say, oh, I can't give that to the Lord. That, that's, that's for me. That's for me. That one's a little bit better. I'm going to keep that one to myself. Now, that, the opposite should be true. In other words, if you see one that is not worthy to give, give him that one as well, as well as a cleaner one before it. So, <clears throat> holy unto the Lord is the tithe, and it's also be indiscriminate. And it's supposed to be a routine. Like I said, you're supposed to go the tenth, the tenth, the tenth. And it's just to be in order. It's just to be in that same routine, in that same cadence, if you will. You're not to pick and choose. You're not to use your judgment when it comes to the tithe. 
The Bible says, as back in Genesis we read, that Eve saw the tree and that it was desired to make one of those. In other words, she saw that tent and she started to reason within herself. She started to think about it. She started to contemplate. But anytime I've had success in tithing, and since I began to, to tithe faithfully once I got to an independent Baptist church, it was the routine of it that made me successful. It was the routine of it that allowed me to get into that rhythm whereby I could continue on in that in that action, in that goodwill towards God, with, without even thinking about it, without even worrying about it. <clears throat> That's a practical. Uh, the next one is, is a purpose. Let's look at the purpose of the tithe. Turn to Genesis chapter 14, if you would. Genesis chapter 14. Way back near the beginning. We're going to talk about Abraham here. And Abraham's experience with the tithe. If you look at Genesis chapter 14... <clears throat> Beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So we see here that Abraham is now in, encountering Melchizedek, who here is referred to as the priest of the Most High God. If you study that, I believe this is a pre-incarnate uh, picture, a pre-incarnate appearance even, of Jesus Christ himself standing before Abraham. And Abraham goes about and has, has a great feast prepared for him, and, and he, he interacts with the Lord here in this situation. And the Lord blesses him, and in return, he gives him, to Abraham, the priest again of the Most High God, the tenth of all. So what you see here is that the tithe, the tenth of all, is being used in order to give unto the priest. It's to give to the leadership. It's to provide for the leadership. The Bible records that in, in, in two different ways. You'll read that if you look to, uh, let's go to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18 that the tithe is to provide for the work of the ministry. It's also to provide for the pre provision of the leadership. Numbers chapter 18, this rings true a little, well, a little bit better. Because what you see in Numbers chapter 18 is the portion of the priests being pictured, being shown how they were to provide for the Levites and for the priests at this time. Look to Numbers chapter 18 and verse 26. Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. So here a tithe of the tithe is taken. And this shall be your heave offering. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye shall also offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes which ye receive of the children of Israel. And ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. So the Levites here are pictured as the work of the ministry. They are the everyday. They are the, uh, the sacrifices. They cleaned. They prepared. They lifted up the tabernacle. They took the tabernacle down when it was time to move. They were the everyday grind, the business of the congregation. That was their job. And they received of the tithe because in the Old Testament, when every one of the tribes was given a portion of land which would be their inheritance, the Levites were given none. Rather, they were given suburbs conjoined unto these different possessions. And their inheritance, the Bible is clear, was the tithes of all of the children of Israel put together. In other words, the one-tenth was given unto the Lord, which was then distributed unto the Levites to provide for them. Right? Because they didn't have land to till. They didn't have secular jobs. They didn't have any way of providing for them. But their inheritance was the Lord, and therefore the tithe that came to the Lord was what they inherited. God allowed for that to be the provision unto the people. And here in this portion of Scripture, we see that the Levites, which again, I believe, represent the work of the ministry, the general daily, day-to-day -day grind of the congregation, 
they would take a tenth of that tenth, and that was to be provision for Aaron, the priest. It was an heave offering. In other words, it was a free will offering lifted up, though it's commanded here in scriptures, that would be given unto Aaron, the priest, and it says, out of all your gifts, you shall offer every heave offering unto the Lord. All your best thereof, even a hollowed portion out of it. And that was specifically to go to Aaron, the, the priest, to provide for him in that time. Verse 8, if you look back, goes on and says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings, of all the hollow things of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing, and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. This shall be thine of the most holy things, reserved from fire. Every oblation of theirs, meaning the people of Israel, every meat offering of theirs, every sin offering of theirs, every trespass offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, the Lord speaking, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. In the most holy place shalt thou eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy unto thee. So just as much as the tithe was deemed holy unto the Lord, now the Lord is turning it around and he is saying, it is holy unto thee. Talking again to Aaron, who would render then unto the priest the oblations that were given unto the Lord by the people of Israel would then become the provision for the people. And it doesn't say that the people were just supposed to give the Levites table scraps or what was left. If you look down at verse 12, it says, All the best of the oil, and all the best of the wine, and of the wheat, the first fruits of them, which they shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. And so the Levites were provided just as if they were the Lord himself, right? Because they would come and bring their sacrifice. And the sacrifices, whether it was uh, a, a heave offering, whether it was a meat offering, a sin offering, a trespass offering, they were first and foremost to God. They were given unto God and they were presented unto God in that way. But then, as they were holy unto the Lord, the Lord used those to provide for the work of the ministry and for the provision of the leaders. So the best of what went to God was used to furnish, was used to take care of the daily grind, the daily necessities, the daily needs within the congregation. I believe we can use these things as a picture and realize that this is the same purpose that it carries today. The tithes are to come in and they are to be holy unto the Lord, set apart unto the Lord. God receives those gladly because they are specific first fruits directed at him. Then God uses those same provisions in order to furnish, to care for, to mind the daily need of the congregation. And above even that, a heave offering is given, which will provide for the leadership. And that same pattern, I believe, works today. Else I would see something change within the New Testament. I'm yet to see this specific order, at least in a picture, right? These things written for our example upon whom the ends of the earth have come, right? I'm yet to see in the Bible where this picture of the tithe which started in Genesis carried on through the Levitical law here and we see even, even more so continuing on all the way to just before the New Testament is coming to an end when God speaks in, in, uh, in, in that book right before the New Testament where he speaks in Malachi will a man rob God wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings so we see the whole of the New Testament carrying that and I believe that carries right on into the New Testament as the provision for not the Old Testament congregation but the New Testament congregation not the Old Testament church in the wilderness but the New Testament church which was bought with the blood of Jesus how much the more shall that church be provided for with the tenth of the offerings I talk about it all the time how the New Testament church is given even more power and I'm not going to make a lot of this, but I believe that the New Testament church has it within their power to do even more so in the areas of tithing than even the Old Testament saints would have had. We have been given power from on high in order to do greater works than these. And that is why I believe this tithing is, is something that, yeah, it's a, it's a very important detail, but it's also something that isn't necessarily the, the biggest of... of uh, 
challenges unto the New Testament church goer, unto the New Testament church member. Rather, it is just another ministry that the Holy Spirit uses His power on His people to perform in them, and it just becomes it just becomes the daily, it just becomes the grind. Just like we we read about that it's it's holy unto the Lord, but it's also just a routine. It's just something that the New Testament believer does repeatedly on that same frequency all the time in order to provide, in order to perform what is needed and what is necessary unto the church. Verse 21 says, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth and come nigh unto the tabernacle that continues on, lest they bear their sin. So there is a specific thing, a specific purpose of that tenth. It was for the service, it was for the Israelites who were of the tribe of Levi, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. In the same way, the service, the serving, the purpose of those that would serve within the congregation, this is what the tenth is for. It is to provide for the needs of not the tabernacle of the congregation, but the congregation itself, the needs of the body of Christ. And that's what we have here today. So this is a very basic tenet of Christianity. This is a very basic thing. And as we have been walking through the different pillars of the Christian life, and you can turn back to Malachi chapter 3 if you like, Malachi chapter 3. We've been walking through the basic pillars of the Christian life. And we talked about church, we talked about Bible reading, we talked about prayer. And believe it or not, I find uh, prayer often to be more difficult than that of, of tithing. Uh, church I enjoy, and so it, it's, it's easy for me to come to church. Um, reading the Bible sometimes can be a little bit of a task, you know, when you're tired and you're just, your eyes are heavy, or you get into a rut where you're just not necessarily, um, <clears throat> I don't know, getting the same sort of feeling, maybe, if I can put it that way, from the reading of the Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like the Lord's, Lord's speaking in the same way, and you kind of find yourself in a rut. That could be a challenge. But tithing, honestly, once you get into the rhythm of it, and it becomes just a cadence of your everyday life, your everyday Christian walk, that becomes easy. You've heard it often said, that, that saying where, where God can do more with nine-tenths of your income than you can do with your 100% of your income. And that's what the tithe is. It's not the Lord trying you. Look at Malachi 3 and verse 10. It says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And there shall not be room enough to receive it. The Bible says, prove me now herewith. This isn't a statute, the tithe, to prove yourself or that God would look to, for you to prove your faithfulness unto him. No, the tithe is actually an act whereby we prove God. Where we buy, where what, whereby we lay before God simply what belongs to him and wait for him to prove himself for it and through it. Look what it says here. Though it does take faith, I believe, and though it does take a commitment from you in the beginning, right? It says here that God's response to you is that, well, Josh is now proving me. He's waiting for me to show myself. And how is the Lord going to show himself? It says, he, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So how this happens is not always financially for everybody. Honestly, we don't, we don't, we don't give, you know, if I make $100, I give my $10, and suddenly God just plops another $100 on my lap, like, woohoo. though that's happened sometimes, right? No, the reality is, is that God is going to pour out a blessing. He's going to open the windows of heaven, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. Well, we know that a lot of the, the gifts that are financial can be received with enough room. I mean, unless you're just, you're just, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars are just poured on you for some reason. But God is here, I believe, talking about something spiritually blessing, something even better than God just returning unto you something financially. Perhaps you give, and that money is used then to, to furnish the salvation of many souls because of, of tracts that are bought, and soul winners go out, and now they have a little bit of ammo that they can read from as, as they give the gospel presentation unto somebody. Maybe that's how God would give the blessing unto you, and that you're reaping great rewards in heaven. I don't know, but all I know is that this is not something, though it takes faith, and it takes commitment in the beginning, 
is not something that God uses to prove us, but rather God wants us to prove himself. Another thing that I see, if you look to Matthew chapter 23, where, whereby the tithe isn't necessarily a really big deal, a really hard thing for the Christian to do. Matthew chapter 23, and we've been here before, Matthew 23, 23. The Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So here, the scribes, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, they had no problem tithing of their mint, tithing of their anise, tithing of everything that came into them, all that they partook of. And yet God here says, okay, that's fine, but ye should have left that undone and done the weightier matters like judgment, mercy, and faith. And so judgment, mercy, and faith, those are bigger deals in the Christian life. Those are more challenging things, uh, matters that you are to not omit. Yes, it does take faith, and I'll say that again, especially in the beginning when you're used to living off of 100% of your income, and then you find out that God requires that you would take 10% of that and just render it back unto him. I don't consider it a gift. I consider it just giving to God what's owed him. But the promise here is that when you take that step of faith, that God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. One more place I'll go to. And this is my experience in this. And if you even talk to my wife Amanda about this, she'll explain the same thing. Um, tithing was perhaps a big challenge for her. See, when I first got into an independent Baptist church and I heard the word of God preached, I said, okay, this is what I have to do. Now at the time, uh, perhaps I was just maybe in a more comfortable financial position or, or an uncomfortable living condition. We can talk more about that later. But I found it easy for myself to tithe of my income. Um, uh, my wife was working uh, a different secular job and everything was kind of split open at the time. We weren't living in the most godly conditions, right? Her being not saved and me being newly saved. But when I first got into an independent fundamental Baptist church after about two years of being saved, I walked in, I heard that I needed to tithe, and I very readily just got on board with that. Okay, and quickly that just kind of became my routine that I would look at it, I would, I would look at how much money I would make, and I would take that amount, even though the government takes a little bit, I would take the full amount and I would just move the decimal place over and give that as my tithe. I got so zealous about that that I started to get excited about the area of giving. And on top of that, the tithe, which is just simply you giving what rightly belongs to God back to him for the work and for the provision of the things that he needs. I went above and beyond and I started to get really excited about something called, called grace giving, which is very popular in the... Uh, in the uh, independent Baptist movement, whereby you, you give of even what you don't necessarily have. In other words, you're stepping out in faith and saying, well, I pledge I will also give this amount of money on top of what I'm required to do based on my income. And so I got really excited about that. Then the time came, though, where, where my wife and I both kind of got on the same page, though, though she wasn't uh, necessarily right on board with it. But we had gotten a little bit tighter in income. And our... our, our our bank accounts kind of became one, and they went from being swollen because of varying things that were going on in our life to be very, very lean, right? And so I remember a specific time where the Lord had provided for me, and I was going to give of my tithe. And my wife says, what is that? <laughs> and I say, this is the tithe. I, I've got to give it to God because it belongs to him. And she's like, uh-uh, we don't have the money for that. We can't be doing that. Okay, so I, not wanting to fight, said, okay, fine, right? Probably not the manliest stance I should have made, but I said, okay, fine. And this is, you, you probably know about me a little bit that, that I tend to uh, not just jump on a decision. I tend to wait a little bit, right? I, didn't, I wasn't giving that tithe right that moment, and she snatched it out. It was going the next day or something like that, right? So I decided to wait on it. I said, okay, I still left that money aside, right? Over the course of the next day, my, my wife had God twisting on her heart, pulling on her heartstrings, getting her, you know, feeling really down and really dumb and really, oh man, like this isn't, this isn't right. Something's not right here. And so she said, you know what? You got to give it. You, you got to do it. You got to do it. This is, this, is, this is what God wants. And so the moment that she did that, the tithe went. She then spent the next day going about her daily routine business. And in that time, 
she checked, you know, the glove box, which we always check, which we always do whatever with. And, and at this time, we're wondering where our food's going to come, where's the next provision. And wouldn't you know it, that within that glove box that we're always going in, she finds a gift card, unopened, and it's for 50 bucks. Okay, so now she's got the provision that she was worried about not having, and it was in the same financial amount that I was tithing that very day. Which she was like, we can't tithe because we need that 50 bucks to live off of. And here she is, opening up, again, something we've always seen, and a miracle happens. And that could have been there all the time. We could have been just blind to it. Who knows? But God used that situation to provoke her heart to make the right decision. And he showed her that he's in control by saying, hey, don't worry about this. Look, you've got 50 bucks still. Right? And, and through that situation, she learned that never again is she going to try to rob God. Is she going to try to withhold what belongs to God? No, it is always better to just... Set aside what belongs to God, just as if you're counting that tenth ram walking into the stall. Just as if you're counting that tenth sheep walking to the stall. As soon as, you're, as, soon as your, uh, your rod drops, that's the one that gives. And that's the same kind of routine I get in. What I've done in, in my life, and I always like to raise the bar a little bit higher just in case. I don't want to be guilty of robbing God. And so I have taken the amount that I make before taxes um, on my biggest paycheck. Okay, this is this is the most I'm gonna make because this is you know I've worked that before I've worked the 60 hours which is pretty much the max that I'm allowed to do, and and I've taken that amount before taxes right because it's of all your increase that you're supposed to give to God. I've taken that amount and I've said this is going to be my biweekly tithe. And so now if I make 100 bucks less than that, 20 bucks less than that, 30 bucks less than that, you know, 300 bucks less than that, whatever it is, right? I still tithe the same amount. And that way, to me, that helps for the situations where I may make a little bit more. In other words, maybe a gift comes in. Maybe a bonus comes in, something I didn't account for. I just always want to be on the up and up with the Lord. And the Lord will just basically, I believe in the, uh, you know, the roles in heaven, or if he's keeping tabs or however it's working, to make sure I'm not robbing him, I'm giving back everything that he's given me in the tenth portion. I believe that that just rolls over. Say I make a little bit more, and then now I'm tithing an extra ten bucks. That that leans towards the area of offering. And that way I'm covered. That way I'm safe. And, and, and if I just get into that routine, in other words, I'm just every bi-weekly just dropping, dro dropping that rod as the tenth. Dropping that rod as the tenth. Then it's a routine for me, and I don't even think about it. Honestly, just take that, set it aside, and give it. Take that, set it aside, not give it. Return it, honestly, because God gave the increase. I'm simply returning unto him, the tenth portion, which is holy unto the Lord and set apart. I had to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So the promise here is that your barns, barns are your store, your stock, what you need essentially to live. There shall be plenty, but then it says here the presses, the wine, the good stuff of life, right? The sweetness, that even spills out and there's room not enough to receive that. It's bursting out with new wine. Why? Because you've honored the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. The first fruits is a hard thing to, to figure out. And I'm trying to basically catch up to this because here's what happens. Here's, here's how Caesar works. He, he, you get paid 20 bucks an hour, right? You work five hours, you get 100 bucks, right? But before you ever see that 100 bucks, Caesar's already taken his 25%, right? He's already taken 25 bucks from that. And so you're in a situation here in Canada where your first fruits are always snatched up by the government, unfortunately. They're taken before God even gets his hands on them. But what I would like to do eventually is get caught up to where my, my, my tithe for this week is coming from the previous week, if that makes sense. In other words, I'm giving him the first, even before Caesar gets to that paycheck, because I've, I've been blessed enough to work a little bit ahead of that. And that's, that's just kind of something uh, I've conceived in my mind. Honestly, all of the ins and outs of tithing are, are basically for you to work out with God and how you can get things aligned. My best advice is to make it a routine. Make it something that you constantly do. You don't even have to think about it. I don't even know if you can set up kind of like a direct 
deposit or something where where your your bank account knows to put it into a separate bank account. Honestly, I don't know all the details of how someone would do it. I just know what I particularly do. But when you get that hundred dollars, you move the decimal place, ten of those dollars belongs unto God right away, without even wavering, without even thinking about it. And when you do that, that's when God really starts to essentially work in your life. Why? Because you're working with him. That's God's that's God's uh, financial plan. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been into into the uh, the tax man, or I've talked to my my dad, who's who you know dollar signs are or at least providing in that area is, is super important. And he's wondering, well, why are you in this this kind of like student issue? Look at you could be out of debt if you had if you had just not given to the church, right? Because that's how the world thinks. Even the financial advisors will say, well, the first thing we need to do is all that money you're giving to the church, apply it to this. Well, no, because if, if I was to do such a thing, I'm no different than Eve. I'm looking at the tree which is forbidden for me to have, which belongs to God, which is set apart, which is a tree that's desired to make one wise, but only because God has set it so, and only because that wisdom belongs unto God, that knowledge belongs unto God. I'm looking at the tithe. I'm looking at the tenth of what God has given me, which he simply just says, hey, give it back. And then I'll use it to shower blessings upon the church, upon others, upon yourself. I can use that 10% for great things. I'm looking at that and saying, nah, I, I can think of something better to do with that. I'm using my own reasoning, I'm using my own sight, I'm using my own lust to do something outside of God's will. And that ain't right. So next pillar that I've talked about is the pillar of tithing. And I believe this is one we just, we just got to get right. We just got to, by faith, decide, okay, God, you paid me 100 bucks this week. That 10%, as fast as I can get to it, I'm setting it aside. That's going to the church. That's going to provide for the needs of the church. That's going to provide for getting people saved. That's going to provide for the leaders of the church. That is going to be provision for whatever you have for it. Because honestly, once I give it back to you, it's, it's not. it was never mine to begin with. It's not mine after. So here you go, Lord. Do with it as you will. we got to decide we want to do that. we got to take that step of faith. we got to make that a routine. Holy unto the Lord, in that routine, without discrimination, without thinking, without reasoning, we just got to remember, we got to decide, we got to reckon that that 10% belongs to God and make the conscious decision to just return it unto Him. And God will take that 90% of your income, even though Caesar took 25 also, God will take that 90% and He will do great things in your life and He will even grow you financially beyond you can even imagine. He will provide for you. I don't know how many times I've looked at the books and been like, I don't even know how we're staying afloat. I don't even know how we're paying rent. I don't even know how, but God has his and he's taking care of his own. It works. Amen. That's God's financial plan. It works every time. We have a good God. There's no other government in the world that takes 10%. And our Lord, our King, he takes 10% of his people. Well, all these crooked governments, they want 20%, 25%. There's some nations over where you're from that they're taking like 50%, 7%. If you get a second job just to make ends meet, man, you might as well just give your whole check away. I've heard from people. It's crazy in some parts of the world. You, you, you just work for the government. Simple as that. We're blessed here, but we're even more blessed to have a God that just wants you to return unto him that 10 so that he can do great things, shower blessings upon you. As he promised in the book of Malachi, he says, prove me here with, maybe I'll shower, or prove me here with, that I will shower the blessing. I love that. I'm going to read it one more time. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That is a great promise. I love that. I love you, Lord. Thank you. Heavenly Father.